Hi everyone, um, my name is Leonara and I'm the program producer for Somerset House Studios. Thanks so much for joining us this evening for Digital Depletion and Conscious Computing, Burnout in the Era of Hyperconnectivity, a presentation by Dr. Rami Gad El Rab. This event is part of Hyperfunctional Ultra Healthy, a dynamic program of new commissions, films, workshops, and conversations considering both our individual health and collective well-being by exploring societal and ecological issues that affect both people and planet. Over the past year, balancing work and leisure has become a dance between multiple screens. And in today's event, Romy will be exploring the era, this era of hyperconnectivity and the effects of technology on mental health. A brief intro to Romy and her work. Dr. Romy Gadol Rab is a consultant psychiatrist and clinical research fellow at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London. She is interested in the condition of human mind and its effects on the and the effects of technology on our mental health. She is also a resident at Somerset House Studios as part of Hyphen Labs, an international team of artists engineers, scientists, and architects creating art at the intersection of technology. Some, housekeep some housekeeping um, for the flow of the event. Uh, Romy will give her presentation for about 45 minutes and then we'll open it up to a Q&A afterwards. Please drop any questions that you have in the chat during the presentation and we'll collate them all and answer as many as we have time for at the end. And with that, I'll hand over to Romy. Thank you. Hi, Leonora. Um, I'm just going to try and share my screen. No. <laughs> uh, always the awkward little bit to start. Always the awkward way. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to kind of start by acknowledging the massive irony of giving a talk about digital depletion, about digital burnout, about Zoom fatigue, when you're probably watching at home on your computer or on a laptop or on your telephone. But if you can kind of stick with me past that, then I want to tell you today about what it means to be hyper-connected, um, how our relationships with technology affect our mental health, and how we might consciously compute and form some better relationships with the technologies that we've become entwined with. I'm going to be playing you quite a few random images, uh, so bear with me with those. Um, and I'm old school, I can't do more than one screen at a time, so you might hear some papers rustling and I might look down. So let's start. What is being hyper-connected? Hyper-connected is the condition of everyone being connected to everybody else and a number of technology-enabled objects that connect us to an infinite amount of digital content all of the time. So for example, in making this talk, I used my laptop. I was able to have access to an infinite amount of research papers, journals, and of course, while I was working, I was also getting distracted and scrolling on Instagram, and I came across some really cool animations that I really liked. So I thought I'll DM the artist, and 10 minutes later, I'm chatting to an artist halfway across the world about the influence of art and the internet on art, and I got permission to use some of his animations that you'll see later. The phenomenon of hyperconnectivity can be overwhelming. If you're lost in a forest, then having GPS might help you, it might save your life, but it can sometimes feel like there's nowhere to escape. The boundaries between work and recreation are being blurred. Our attention is being hijacked by notifications and we're part of never-ending, unfinished conversations on WhatsApp, Slack, Telegram, Signal, there's probably some more that I'm missing. When an era where technology is infiltrating our daily lives faster than we have learned how to really adopt them in healthy ways, and that's why it's leading to burden, burnout, and this phenomenon of digital depletion. In her 1985 essay, A Manifesto for Cyborgs, the professor in science and technology, Donna Haraway, writes, a cyborg is a cybernetic organism, a hybrid of machine and organism, a, creator, a creature of social reality as well as fiction. I want you to look at your hands for a moment. How many of you have your mobile phone in your hand? Or are you wearing a smartwatch or a Fitbit? Maybe you can type cyborg in the chat and I can know how many I'm working with. 
have you actually thought about why your phone is in your hand while you're kind of watching me talk, talk to you online? Is it because you think this might get boring and so you have a backup plan of something potentially infinitely more interesting than what I'm saying? Maybe we can do an experiment. Maybe you can put your phone like away for the rest of this uh, talk. And if you do really find that you need to go and pick up your phone, take note of what it is that really has called your attention. Uh, maybe you can tell us later. In the Cyborg Manifesto, Haraway also writes, the problem with cyborgs is that they are the illegitimate offspring of materialism and patriarchal capitalism. I'm gonna talk about this paper, Digital Hyperconnectivity in the Self by Rogers Brubaker. He's a professor of sociology at UCLA. And he says that hyperconnectivity recasts social interactions, culture, economics, politics, and the self. We no longer go online because a part of us is kind of always already online. We have second selves. Others can interact with ourselves, even our second selves, even when they're asleep. You might, you might even meet your next partner as, he asks you, as they ask you on a date on Tinder while you're sleeping. We have new ways of constructing ourselves from the outside. And in doing so, the self has become service to techno-social systems. Snapchat, Insta, TikTok, all enable you to alter versions of yourself. You can alter less desirable parts of yourself through filters. You can add parts to yourself, like ears. Hyperconnectivity has led to this self-objectification where we turn objectification, where we turn the objectifying gaze back on ourselves, internalize those standards. We internalize those standards of appraisal and we act on our bodies with those standards. This can be described as digitized dysmorphia. Digitized dysmorphia is a discrepancy between standards imposed by social media when comparing ourselves to filter enhanced versions of ourselves. People are taking pictures of their enhanced selfies to plastic surgeons and asking for them to be recreated. And these kind of filtered versions of ourselves are often completely unobtainable. They can be very problematic. And in sometimes they're completely fantastical. Young men and women are comparing themselves to virtual influencers like Lil Michaela and Shudu Brown, who you'll see shortly a black virtual supermodel created by a white male photographer. And it's no surprise that teens these days are photoshopping their images because society and social media is telling them that they're not good enough. Selfies make up one third of all posts by 18 to 25 year olds. This can lead to feelings of low self-worth, social anxiety, and in worst case scenarios, eating disorders, self-harm, and even suicide. This online presentation extends further than just thinking about ourselves, but also extends into our behaviors and actions. We're now alert to things that could be potentially shareable. The, re the researcher Jurgensen calls this the Facebook eye. Even when you're not connected to technology, we're looking around at things with the view of whether they would be interesting to a potential audience. For example, in Siberia, there's this really bright blue lake that people are flocking to, to take photos for Instagram. But the reason it's bright blue is because actually there's a leak of chemicals from a nearby power station causing it to be that way. So it's probably not the best place to be in a bikini. This Facebook eye also extends to creativity and undoubtedly affects things like art and design. In an interview with The Real Review magazine, the architect and off-white designer Virgil Abloh describes, there is the design of the shoe and then there is the design of the images for a tool like Instagram. If we didn't have social media, would you really need your bagel to look like a unicorn? And would you dare to order a cappuccino that has your face on it? 
And although I want to focus here on mental health, I think it's very important that we think about techno-capitalism because the two really go hand in hand. And if it wasn't for the way that corporations built their platforms, then I really wouldn't need to give this talk at all. Numbers are built into the designs of these social media platforms. Likes have become a universally known social currency. They add a social layer of motivation to everything that we do, making us want to share every single action. And every little tweet, every swipe, every screenshot can be recorded as a data point and treated as a digital object by data brokers and algorithms. Rogers goes on to say, we have reached a state of algorithmic objectification of self. I often say that my Spotify playlist knows me better than myself, and it actually might be the case. It knows my emotions, what pictures I like, all my habits, what I buy online, how many times I might even text my mum. And that all gets fed back to me in highly specific adverts and playlists that suit my mood. This level of hyperconnectivity can lead to us feeling depleted. So don't get me wrong, I don't want to say that all technology is bad. Um, I've seen firsthand working as a doctor during the pandemic, what a difficult time it's been for everybody, what a toll it's taken on people's mental health. Um, on a practical level, having video conferencing has helped me to reach out to patients and help them in a time that they really need help. It's also helped people who are isolated and separated from their friends and family and loved ones to still have a really, you know, still be able to contact with them, have contact with them. But it's also really important that we really kind of understand in a deep way how these technologies affect us and so that we can use them in a way we choose to. Our connectivity affects our neurochemistry. This amazing picture, to me anyway, is a real scientific diagram that I found online. Uh, I kind of like to think that it was maybe made by a neuroscientist on acid, because it's just a bit, it's, it's very colourful. And what we're actually showing here is um, the dopamine pathways in parts of your brain. And there are two really important parts involved when we're thinking about why we hit to some of these technologies. One is called the mesolimbic pathway, it's involved in rewards, and one is the mesocortical pathway. It encodes emotion and motivation. This is dopamine. When we do something pleasurable, or something that makes us happy, dopamine is increased, and in turn, will be involved in encoding memories, and, attribute import and it will attribute importance to stimuli associated with getting that reward. In technology, that might look like your phone buzzing, you pick it up, you see that someone's liked your picture, so you feel popular, you feel good, and then you get more dopamine over here in your synapses. So now posting is associated with a reward, feeling popular. It's called a hooked phenomenon. Here, you have a trigger, an action, and then a reward, and that reward gets you invested and keeps you coming back for more and more. And that's really good for platforms like Facebook because they want you to keep returning back, seeing if you've had any more comments or if you're checking back for any more likes, but then you get distracted with something else and then you see advertisements and that adds to their revenue. Facebook is, has a net worth of $527 billion. Hi, Romy. Sorry to interrupt. Um, there's a bit of feedback. Um, so maybe just uh, making sure that the presentation papers aren't directly on the mic. Oh, sorry about that. Thank no you. Worries. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> OK, so I'm actually going to take you back to something you probably learned in school. Um, so bear with me. It, the phenomenon I've been talking about is not actually new. So in 1902, the Russian physiologist Pavlov described a similar kind of phenomenon when he, you know, this phenomenon Pavlov's dogs, where he discovered that if he rang a bell every time he fed his dog, then eventually when the dogs heard the bell ring, they would salivate, thinking that they would anticipate food even if they didn't see any. And this is called classical conditioning. It explains why when we hear our phone vibrate, we quickly rush to pick it up in anticipation of a reward. The thing is, 
you don't always get a reward. It's not always a like or your friend commenting something positive. It could be an email from a credit card company, it could be your boss. The most effective way, this is the most effective way to maintain a behavior. It makes it more alluring when you don't know what's coming, whether it's something good or bad, so it makes us more inclined to go and reach for it. This is called operant conditioning, and it's the same kind of conditioning that works with gamblers using slot machines. This keeps you kind of going back, putting more money in the machine, because if you knew it was going to give you money every fifth time, it wouldn't be as exciting. It's the same thing that keeps us going back to our phones 150 times a day. And dopamine doesn't just act when we're getting the reward. It's also involved in our motivational pathways and processes. So it makes us want to do the things that will get us more dopamine. So playing one more level on a game or posting one more selfie. This can lead to behaviors like addiction. Internet addiction is actually an emerging field within psychiatry, um, but the language of addiction in relation to use of the internet is still something quite controversial, both to the medical field and to the wider public. In countries like Korea and China, internet addiction is actually well recognized and the, and the disorder, and they have um, like treatment centers to treat the disorder all over the country. In China, there's even a military-run boot camp for those with internet addiction. The director of this military-run boot camp says that internet addiction is the consecutive use of the internet for six hours a day for more than three months. I wonder how many of you kind of meet that at the moment. Now, this definition doesn't actually include work. But I think even if we exclude work and we think about how much time we spend on Netflix, scrolling on our phones, texting people on WhatsApp, we might be coming close to that amount. There's a film called Web Junkies made in 2013, um, which is a very interesting watch. It depicts life in a Chinese internet rehabilitation center. And you hear stories of teenagers going three days straight in internet cafes and even wearing nappies so they wouldn't be disadvantaged by taking time out of their day to go to the bathroom. In the UK, internet addiction, like I said, is not a recognized mental health disorder, although gaming disorder has recently been added to the international classification of diseases, and we have our first NHS clinic for gaming disorder here in London. The definition of any addiction is chronic brain disorder and every addiction where the chemical or behavioral shares certain characteristics. And I'm going to talk to you through a few of these and you can see if any of them resonate with you. So salience, that's having a preoccupation with technology, for example, with your phone. Compulsive overuse, are you posting numerous times throughout the day. Um, can it modify your mood? Does it make you happy to watch TikTok dancing or memes? Um, does it alleviate your distress? So if you're feeling bored, or unhappy, does it help you to scroll on Instagram? Does it lead to tolerance? Do you need to reach like another level and another level in a game in order to get the same pleasure? or have incrementally more likes on every photo that you post? Do you get feelings of withdrawal? Uh, I'm sure you've all at one point left your phone at home and felt the horror when you're halfway towards your destination and turn around and come back. You get the same sort of feeling when you have 10% battery and, you're, and you think your phone's gonna die. And this really important one here is continuing using something despite the negative consequences. So with technology, we've seen that this can affect relationships. It can um, affect your work, your schoolwork, if you're distracted by technology all the time. And even worse than that, you can risk your life actually uh, by driving and texting at the same time. So I've got some data from the US and they say that 11 teenagers are killed every day by distracted driving use um, because you're using your telephone. 
and that distractions from the phone are involved in 25% of all car accidents in America. Internet addiction is a global problem. It transcends culture, race, age, and gender, and there's still really little known about it and about the long-term effects of these kind of internet addictions on our brain development. I'm quickly gonna to touch on the idea of psychoinformatics. So um, usually when we wanna think about how something like technology affects our mental health, we might do interviews with people, make them fill in questionnaires, or like back in the days, or well, sometimes now I guess, they still do sort of lab experiments, maybe more on animals. Um, and that's maybe how we would understand how we would get affected by these things. But now there's this new emerging field of psychoinformatics where we can take information from computer scientists to try and understand our behaviors. So for example, we can decipher what mood states we're in by text mining how many happy face emojis you might have texted that day and correlating it precisely to exactly the amount of time you're spending online. You can see if spending more time on a certain social media app lends, uh, you know, ends up with you texting more happy faces or more sad faces, or you know, words particularly that are kind of happier or might, uh, you know, <laughs> lead to you sounding sad. This could be used against us in advertising, but I hope it actually furthers self knowledge and in the end might lead to changes in tech development for the good. So now I'm gonna come on to the ironic topic of Zoom fatigue. We've been feeling kind of overworked by our technology, particularly in a pandemic when many of us have been working from home. We can feel physically drained and depleted after spending hours and hours on Zoom. This is actually quite a new phenomenon to me because pre-pandemic, I'd say I had maybe one Zoom call a week or a month, um, and now I seem to only exist on Zoom. At the beginning of the pandemic, I attended my first virtual conference. This was the Internet Age Media Conference, and it's usually held in Barcelona. And while this time there wasn't as many beers, you can see that people still look really happy, they're waving, they're very happy to be on this Zoom call because this was at the very beginning of 2020 and little did they know they're about to spend their next year solely existing on Zoom. How come we feel so exhausted after we've been taking video calls, even though we've just been sitting in one place? Video calls require increased concentration and attention, emotional intelligence to kind of work out what the other person's feeling when you can't really see all of their body language. It's harder to coordinate eye contact. You might feel like you're stuck in one place or worse, you might actually take your laptop with you to places like the bathroom because you feel like you can't leave a meeting. You're also confronted with your own face throughout the whole day. And not that you can tell from my numerous uh, screenshot Zoom selfies, but I'm actually really, really sick of looking at my own face. I feel like I know every weird facial expression that I have, and I can agonize over every new wrinkle that appears. These are some signs that you might have digital depletion, that you might be feeling burnt out. Things like tiredness, cynicism, lower work standards. If you couple Zoom fatigue with the distractions that we get from emails, endless WhatsApp chains, technology malfunctions, you might be having to share your computer with a sibling, with a family member, you might be homeschooling on it, and maybe have Wi Fi issues. I might be having that today. Um, this can lead to lots of feelings of stress and burnout. And it's actually an occupational phenomenon that ends up with lots of people needing time off work and can lead to mental health problems like depression. So what can we do? 
I'd like to think about what I'm naming conscious computing. Conscious computing is to be aware of these effects of technology like I've been describing from the effects on our neurochemistry to why they keep us coming back compulsively. To be conscious is to be aware of your surroundings and is to have knowledge of something. The dictionary gives this example of, we are co of being conscious to the extent of a problem. So if we're truly conscious to how technology is affecting our mental health, then maybe we can make choices as well to try and mitigate some of those. Like Leonara said in the beginning, uh, hyperfunctional ultra healthy aims to address kind of that it's not about this new year, new you, or downloading one of the 47,000 kind of wellness apps that are on the app store at the moment. It's not about giving into the unrealistic pressures of a capitalistic filled wellness industry. These COVID technological shifts are likely to last beyond the pandemic. So we need to foster our own personal relationships with our technologies and find ways to build a more emancipatory future with technology. I could tell you to turn your computer off, turn off your phone, turn off your TV, and then I can finish my talk. Maybe we could have a break. But abstinence from technology isn't actually, you know, a realistic thing that we can do. We're working from home. Students need to learn using the internet. We now have internet-based homeschooling. So being conscious is having knowledge of how the technology affects us. And then we can choose which bits we turn off and which bits we try to engage with in a healthy way. If you've ever seen a psychiatrist, you'll know that we're pretty obsessed with sleep. Things like your sleep, your diet, and getting dopamine from things like exercise, not notifications, are sometimes thought of as basic, but they're really, really fundamental to your human needs and for a human to survive. It can be very hard for us to have control of things like our sleep when corporations like Netflix are listing sleep as their main competitor and not HBO. Have you taken a digital inventory? Corporations are actually very well aware of the addictive natures of many of their apps that they design. And so they've kind of had to make these digital well-being tools and I would argue that they're a lot less sexy than the tools that they designed to actually keep us addicted in the first place. They can be hidden away somewhere in your phone. This is an example of the Google digital well-being that I have on my phone. It will show you how many notifications you get in a day. So here this is showing 898 notifications, and that's not even a particularly inflated number. So if you haven't already picked up your phone, during this talk, maybe next time you do, have a look and you might be surprised at how many times you're being distracted throughout your day. You can also use these apps to set locks on apps that you no longer have control of. And you can turn on things like night mode that will make your phone black and white like after 10 p.m. Um, and that will also help prevent the negative effects on melatonin, which is a hormone we need to help us sleep. Of course, there might be some apps that you might need to completely delete. I know lots of people delete Instagram because uh, they feel it's not good for their mental health. But if there are apps like a certain game that's preventing you picking up your children from school or a gambling game that you're financially kind of losing out from, then maybe complete abstinence to those particular apps are warranted. Here are some ideas for cyber hygiene. We need to think of other ways we can break the loops. So the digital world is full of false urgencies, like notifications often pop up in the color red, like danger, so that we are like really drawn to them and feel like we have to go and see what's going on there. Once you click on one notification, you end up scrolling for a long time. You can turn off your vibrations uh, and all your notifications especially if you have a smartwatch. I don't think that you need to be reminded all the time of every little thing that's going on. You can turn off your last online and your red receipts. These kind of give you an unnecessary pressure to respond to messages 
and might also give you painstaking anxiety about why someone has read your message and not responded. You can find ways to go analog. So have you bought a watch? So like I was saying, instead of getting, looking at your phone to check the time and then seeing notification and ending up in a kind of scroll hole, then you can just look at your time on a watch. Um, you could get a real alarm. So if you're woken up by a real alarm clock, instead of again, first thing you do in the morning with your kind of precious first thoughts before you've kind of reflected on what dreams you had last night. If you use your phone alarm, and it's happened to me many times, you look, you see a notification, you end up on Instagram, and before you know it, you've let over 100 people into your bedroom before you've even had coffee. And the other problem with this is if you think those people are doing something more exciting than you, if they're on a beach somewhere, if they're looking more beautiful, you might actually start your day feeling really bad about yourself. You might want to think about having tech-free areas of your home or work. Um, I saw a new design the other day where it was like a butter, what would you call it? Like a butter holder. Um, <laughs> and it actually blocks all phone reception so the idea is you put it on your dinner table and if you put everyone would have to put their phones in there and so that you wouldn't play on your phone over the dinner table and then you'd actually concentrate on having conversations with your friends and family you should also think about cultivating your offline life and i know this is very difficult at the moment when we're in, in a pandemic um, but if there's anything else you enjoy like whether it's cooking or some sort of crafting or running um, then try, try and get into that if you can, instead of relying on everything on a screen. It goes without saying, if we can connect to nature, it has loads of positive effects on our mental health. And if things are getting a bit much for you at the moment, or you think you're struggling, there are lots of options for seeing a psychologist, having talking therapy, or maybe even having professional help, or um, like personal help at work, speaking to a boss. If you need some time out. I'm hoping we can avoid getting to a place where we need to have our own internet rehabilitation centres here in the UK, or that we'll need more extreme measures. For example, in Korea, the government has had to introduce a shutdown law blocking gamers under 16 from playing between midnight and 6am. I don't think we should have to rely on government restrictions for us to have better relationships with our technology. Now, the last thing I just wanted to finish on was thinking about art as resistance. As I'm talking to you here from Somerset House, it's only fitting to mention this. Through my time of working with Hyphen Labs as a Somerset House Studio resident, I've got to see the way art is used to educate the public and help us question things like the intimate relationships we have with the technologies in our everyday lives. In this performance by Philippe Villas-Boas, The Cross, he carries this Facebook cross commenting on the impression of digitalization and where technology meets religion. We even had last year, the Somerset House studio resident, Nastya Sade Ronko, spent six months living without the internet. She left this email out of office, inviting people to send her letters or drop by her studio and she discussed the importance of human connection she felt by the letters that she received and the positives in waiting for gratification. I'm just gonna leave you now with this video by Hyphen Labs called The Gospel According to Yawn. It was part of the Somerset House 24 seven exhibition last year, and it reinforces the idea that we should use sleep as an act of resistance to the techno capital world that we live in. It's tough to quit scrolling. Just ask any of the 2.71 billion smartphone users who continue to browse regardless of the toll on their sleep. Our sleep is in danger. Corporations list sleep as a primary business competitor, designing addictive interfaces to keep us on the conveyor belt of consumption. If capitalism's quest is to control all of human life, Sleep is our last resistance.
So what can you do? In a world in which sleep itself becomes an act of resistance, yawning can get us there. Sleep will save us. Yawn, and yawn often. Yawn for your right to sleep and dream. Yawn to resist the commodification of sleep. Enjoy a yawn today. This broadcast has been developed for 24-7 by Hyphen Labs. Side effects may include drowsiness, snoring, comfort, dreams, rest, regular heart rate, pain relief, energy, good humor, good complexion, appetite, optimism, and productivity. To join the resistance, turn off all notifications and all electronic devices. Here ends the reading of the Gospel according to Yawn. Hi. Thanks so much, Romy, um, for sharing your research and your um, insights. Um, I think it'll be great to jump straight into some questions um, and taking this moment as well to encourage any um, anyone watching, if you've got a question, just drop it into the chat um, and we'll pick it up. Um, so I guess one of the things that came out from um, your presentation um, was, I mean, the whole thing is about digital depletion, but I was wondering if you could unpack a little bit more about what it is that leads to the digital depletion, like what it is about the technology and our interfacing with it that kind of um, leads us to exhaustion and like and digital fatigue? I think what it kind of comes down to is that we're having to expend more energy to do, like for example with Zoom, when you were before Zoom, um, when you have a meetings in real life, we're very used to that exchange. We're very used to kind of picking up on subtle eye movements if someone's looking bored or distracted, but it's really difficult to tell on Zoom those kind of things. So it takes us like more energy we kind of also feel like we have to be looking all the time and that we're engaged all the time. So it's kind of when we have to expend more energy, we could call it having like an increased cognitive load, like our brain is just having to do more. And so it leads us feeling really exhausted. Yeah, I, I can relate. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you've also touched on some practical steps that we can take to kind of reconnect with, ourse with ourselves as well um, and kind of creating a little bit of a distinction between um, ourselves, our individual selves and technology. Can you say anything um, a little bit more about um, like the importance of sleep hygiene and the impacts of maybe staying on your phone, I guess, like a little bit too long? Um, I was listening to, ironically, like a Google podcast about sleep. Um, and I think one of the researchers mentioned something like it's staying on your phone for like too long is akin to like changing time zone. Um, wondering if you've come across anything like that or just, I guess, yeah, the importance of, of sleep. Yeah, well, I think, um, like you were saying, if you, I mean, I think people describe this a lot, so I'm, I'm sorry if everybody knows this already, but when you use your phone, it kind of el uh, eliminates this blue light and that almost simulates the sunlight. So that's why they might be saying it's kind of like, almost like your, um, you know, jet lag, that kind of thing. So if you're looking at something that's like sunlight just before you go to bed, it's tricking your brain into thinking it's time to still stay awake. So it stops this hormone being made called melatonin. So melatonin is a hormone that's made in our brain that when it's released, it makes us feel tired and know that it's time to sleep. So that's why it's really important um, not to use your phone before bed. Um, I actually thought of something else, maybe for your last question, is why we feel more exhausted as well, is I feel personally that it takes me longer to do things this way. I'm having to like adapt to new technologies, look at messages on Snap, Slack, have like 20 different emails back and forth with people when usually I probably just popped into their office and and worked it out kind of in a quicker way and I read like it was probably a meme to be honest <laughs> great research um we said if you work for one extra hour a day during the year like you know just for those five days of the week throughout a year you essentially cancel out all your annual leave because it adds up to 35 days so it could be a reason why you feel tired and then, you know, at the moment, we, you know, it's very difficult to have a proper break when you can't travel anyone, or you can't like hug your loved ones and do those things that kind of make you feel good as well. Yeah, that kind of leads me to a question that I had. Um, I guess, yeah, many of us right now are working from home. Um, all our, of our social interactions are virtual. And though there's like, there are some pros and cons to that, like people who maybe have like social anxiety, um, but then obviously on the other side, you've got people who um, 
kind of deeply crave like that IRL interactions for their own energy source and to just keep us human. Um, how, like in any case, like we're gonna have to rebuild some of our social skills as we kind of like re-emerge into like the normal world after all of this. Um, yeah, how do you reckon that's going to look like? Do you think we'll be like more or less human? How, like, is there anything um, that you're encountering in your, in your practice uh, that's kind of like showing hints to the lasting effects of the way that we're so digitized? It's mm, a good question. I, what I hope is that we take the kind of good parts of this experience, um, and I guess we're talking about technology, but that's also been fueled by the pandemic, so they're kind of going hand in hand at the moment. So I'd like to think that we take some of the good bits of like actually it being easier to communicate in, in other ways sometimes instead of like trekking across London for a half an hour meeting, for example. Um, or having that flexibility to work from home when you need to, or for some people who have children, you know, if we could take an element of like working from home days where I don't have to get dressed up and things like that, um, then, then maybe we can get like a bit of a balance. But I think I think people, I don't know, people I speak to are still really, really craving that, that human interaction. Phys some people, you know, haven't had any physical touch in a long time, it's something that we really need. Um, yeah. But yeah, for certain people, for example, I do I do work with people that have social anxiety, and there are certain like platforms that help them reach like special support groups that they wouldn't have done if that technology didn't exist. So I think there is still a place for lots of different technologies. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question through. Um, someone has said, every time I log on to Facebook to, che to check a message, research a company, et cetera, I'm instantly distracted by something else. Anything, I, anything, I can lose five minutes plus just scrolling. How can I stop this? I think, unfortunately, that's, that is the way they're designed. And you'll see that if you watch certain programs and read certain books, often the designers who made these things come back later after they've left Facebook and they're like, oh yeah, we designed that, it was really bad. So they've designed the kind of infinite scroll, a scroll that will never end to keep you precisely like that. Like, I don't know if you remember a time when Instagram used to say like, oh, you're all caught up now. Like you've seen nothing your friends have posted, like that never happens. Um, I mean, that's saying every time you log into Facebook, all I can say is maybe set boundaries of yourself of when you're going to let yourself log into Facebook. So don't put any notifications on Facebook because I doubt anything is that urgent that you need to see on Facebook in that moment. So if you could say like, fine, every day at 3 p.m. when I'm making my cup of tea, I can have like 10 minutes on Facebook, then maybe that would be a healthier way. Or when the kettle clicks, you have to turn it off, I don't know. Yeah, like small measures like that. It's, it's also like working out the moments where you're more dr drawn to yourself in your personal life. Um, on just touching like the, the tech companies and social media companies as well, can you speak a little bit about any um, policy or any ideas around um, duty of care? Because, you know, these apps are designed to kind of like keep us engaged, but before we kind of like reach a stage where it's like critical and it becomes like the, a need for medical intervention. Uh, do you know of any kind of, um, yeah, tech companies that are working um, to mitigate digital hyperconnectivity, even though it seems like going against their MO? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think because there's been more and more research in these areas, like they're they're having to at least show that they're doing something. So most of these big tech companies will have like an ethics kind of committee, um, or like now particularly not just using psychology to hook us more, but thinking about their their impact. So for example, I know there was lots of difficulties around a time where it was felt like Facebook was leading to kind of teenage increase in self harm and things like that. So you know that. There are, there are things that they try to implement, like, um, for example, on Instagram, they might show, like, trigger warnings so that, you know, if you think that something is violent, it might trigger someone. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, they, they, they've tried to make technologies that will try, a bit like what I was saying, when they can almost, like, pick up words that might seem like someone might be suicidal, for example, so mm -hmm. that it will show the messages to get help in that moment. But yeah, like I said, otherwise, 
you know, it may come to a time where we need kind of government intervention, like like they are doing in countries like Korea. Uh -huh. um, more questions are starting to come in now. Um, how did you become interested in tech and its neurological effect on us? Was there a catalyst for your beginning um, to research this? Uh, so, mm, I think probably I took a career break from psychiatry for a bit and uh, was working in like design. And as soon as you start working in design, you start learning about user experience and things like that. And you see that the two are really interlinked. And I saw some of the work that Hyphen Labs was doing because I was in Barcelona at the time where Eche from, from Hyphen Labs is. And they were using like virtual reality and studying things like cognitive bias using virtual reality. I just thought that that was amazing and it was kind of interlinking everything I was interested in. So luckily when Somerset uh, Hyphen Labs kind of got their residency at Somerset House, I also moved back to London and then could continue to kind of work with them part-time as working back as a psychiatrist. I think it's such an interesting combo um, that you have like an artistic um, practice or links and then also like you're fully like in the clinic um, kind of like dealing with um, issues very much like on the front line. So fair play to you. <laughs> um, and then another question, uh, what about the commodification of sleep itself? Like cell, like sleep trackers, office, nap, nap pods, sorry. Um, how can sleep remain a tool for resistance? I think it's about setting those boundaries. Like, it, you know, all the kind of, I almost hated making that slide with all the kind of advice to give, like, oh, get an alarm clock, buy a watch, because I think everybody's heard this. It seems really basic, um, but we're not actually doing any of it. So I don't know if we just need to have someone to keep like forcing it down our throats and saying, actually, we have to do this. We have to sleep. Um, you know, may maybe if we like twist that statistic around work, you know, an extra hour of work, removing your annual leave, think about every hour extra you spend scrolling like cumulatively over time, how much sleep you're losing because of that. Um, mm. And we know that we need sleep to be healthy, to lay down memories. Um, so what else can we do? <laughs> yeah. Um, and can you recommend any specific apps uh, to help with digital well-being? I have to say, I don't, particularly use any apps apart from the ones that come with my phone. So that one I showed by uh, by Google, the kind of digital wellness app I use because I can set a lock on how many hours I'm allowing myself to spend on something like Instagram. Um, at 10 p.m. my phone will go on to black and white. So it's mm -hmm. actually like much less attractive to watch. Not that I'm on TikTok, but you know, these like <laughs> TikTok dancing kind of thing when they're just in black and white. Or if I follow a lot of artists, like looking at art in black and white isn't always um, kind of as interesting. Um, the other thing you can do is use use some of the, the average tools on your phone for you. So it sounds silly, but you set an alarm to wake up every morning. You could set an alarm to go to sleep. And it seems like we need to be like spoon fed these things. But, but when you were a child, you didn't have to think about any of these things. Your mum would come and bring you food when it's time to eat. Or she'd be like, okay, it's time to go to bed now. Um, and sometimes like, you know, when we're getting really stressed out and burnt out by technology, we almost need our hand held. Be like, uh, okay, now it's time to go to bed. So if you set an alarm at 10.30, whatever you're doing, like if you're playing a computer game, you're like, okay, every every bit more I play in this computer game, I'm eating into my sleep time. Uh, it's quite funny that like n now, because we're not going out as much, like that burnout is like so focused on the digital, but it's the same could be said for like, uh, like uh, you know, urban lifestyle where you're you at work events, etc., and not really taking the time to like properly look after yourself. So, in a way, there is a silver lining of this time to kind of um, have people reflect and set the things in place to really just have like the basic, fundamental. How do I look after myself? Like structures in in place as a way to kind of like I don't know, learn those things that we kind of like replace with convenience a lot of the time when we're like in, totally. yeah. It sounds like you want to set like a Cinderella alarm. So if you're out <laughs> at something, it'll be like, oh, 10 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, that's why I hope that we take we take the good bits. Mm. And 
certainly like now we're so used to being on our own or doing things slowly or cooking for ourselves I I can't personally imagine being out every single night kind of after work always having some sort of plan meeting someone Mm. and another question through uh does the tech industry need to introduce some sort of overt in your face warnings which the gov uh, the gambling industry um has had to do I think that's an interesting strategy I think I read example like well it's not not exactly not exactly the answer to your question but in Korea I think they're waiting for a law to pass that the gaming companies will have to invest money into stopping people becoming addict, addicted to their into their games so maybe that's mm-hmm. whether they're investing in thinking about how they design the games differently or um yeah any um, yeah, how they design the games differently or things that can be done to help. I don't know if that means they contribute to some of the rehab centers, which would seem a bit weird. Um, mm. I actually work, once worked in a hospital where it was in Samoa, where they had a diabetes ward with people who were very, you know, had problems with weight and it was sponsored by McDonald's and it had like Ronald McDonald all over the walls oh. and like the chip man. And that, that kind of makes me you know, it's a bit weird thinking about the gaming industry kind of contributing in that way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, maybe we'll have to, you know, at one point, place. yeah. And, and at one point, remember, there were like advertisements for like, the doctor says one cigarette a day will help you kind of thing. Yeah. But, you know, doctors advertising cigarettes. Um, so again, you know, it can be controversial to com- to kind of compare internet addiction with other sorts of addiction. But I think we should have like warnings. Great. Like maybe when you download the app, for example, like, you know, make sure you're over 18 if it really is like a gambling, a gambling app. And and there's also, I mean, I don't know if lots of people know about it, but within games themselves, there are these things called loot boxes where you can pay physical money to get certain attributes within games. And again, people want to like do better and better in games. Um, and they end up spending lots of money or kind of stealing money from their, you know, young kids stealing money from their families to try and feed into this um so yeah i think certainly they have to have some sort of like way of stopping that Mm -hmm. that can't be undone by kids because that's how kids get uh over that law in careers they just go and log in with their their parents account into the internet and then they can just gain after midnight on their parents account yeah there's dangers in those like loopholes because it's not like there's someone literally there checking um so like that kind of um checkpoint doesn't really yeah it's it's easily kind of uh avoided in a way but yeah th- thank you so much for me um if there are any more questions speak now drop them in the chat oh one's just come through uh what can you advise about curating and managing your social media apps to make them better for your mental health um so i think it's a little bit like where i was saying taking an inventory so be really conscious next time you're going on something like Facebook or Instagram, look at what you're seeing. If you notice an emotion like feeling envious or unhappy at the things you see, then should you really be following those accounts? Um, so whether it's the app itself or whether it's the individual things within the app. So I know some people say, well, I'll only use it for work. So they'll just unfollow all friends. Um, And it's not that you're being negative, like everybody wishes the best for their friends, but sometimes it can be really hard if you, if you, if you're having a rough time. And of course, on social media, we only post the kind of best bits, uh, then it can make us feel down. Um, Curating your social media apps. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit, I'm going to say it, but it's a bit like Marie Kondoing your wardrobe. Like you should kind of look at the apps, whether they bring you joy or not. Mm. Again, like I downloaded Strava and I thought, oh, this is good. It's going to help me like exercise more. And all I see is people like outrunning me every single day because I obviously <laughs> cannot run. So <laughs> yeah, that might not be the best app for me. And maybe I should just call that one. But for someone else, they're like out here beating their personal best kind of every other day. And, and that's a good app for them. Yeah. Um, and do you believe understanding ourselves as cyborgs in is to buy into the propaganda of technocapitalism. Is this the best way to understand ourselves? Um, 
I guess like for the kind of purpose of this talk, I was using it as a, a bit of a sort of metaphor to think about how the technology is, is so embedded and it has become an extension of ourselves. Um, whether it buys into the propaganda of techno capitalism. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's a little bit of my point. <laughs> Great. Um, I guess if there are no more questions, that seems to be the last one. And we're also nearing the hour mark. Um, uh, that just leads me to say thank you so much, Romy, for taking part in this edition of Hyperfunctional Ultra Healthy. Um, and to everyone who's tuned in to watch, um, for more on the program and what's to come, you can head over to our website uh, somersethouse.org.uk and have a look at uh, what other events we are rolling out across the month. But yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> See you.